Bob Wiener. This is my collection, which I've given to the Rye Art Center to show. I'm so proud of it. I'm still fascinated by it. I started 50 years ago when I went to the Museum of Natural History and became fascinated with the dinosaurs and the minerals. Later in my life, I was in a position to collect some minerals that I have, and then I really couldn't stop collecting them because wherever I travel, they fascinate me. So I'll turn this over to the Rye Art Center now. It's my pleasure to be here and I hope you all enjoy the minerals. Hello, welcome to the gallery of the Rye Art Center. My name is Gail Roman and I will take you on a virtual tour of our current exhibition, Nature's Art, Geodes from the collection of Robert R. Wiener. And thank you, Bob Wiener, for making this exhibit possible and for supporting the Rye Art Center in so many thoughtful ways. Bob is the ultimate connoisseur. He seeks to share his passion broadly, and now, here with us. Let's take a minute to gaze at these amazing specimens. I think that you will be quite interested in their variety and their variability. First, let's ask and find out what is a geode. A geode is a rock with a hollowed out cavity. Crystals form in that cavity where minerals have been deposited by groundwater or hydrothermal activity over millions of years. At the edges of this specimen, you could see the rock in which the, these crystals were formed, creating a geode. Cracking open a geode might reveal a colorful crystal inside, as in this amethyst from Brazil. Where do these rocks come from? As you can see from the map, everywhere. Wherever you see a red dot, you might find geodes below the surface. Some may date from the time of this trilobite fossil, amazingly well-preserved and believed to be one of the oldest creatures to inhabit the planet, between 500 and 200 million years ago. Not a geode, but geode and fossil both tell the story of our planet. Geodes are found in the Earth's crust, in any type of terrain or watery environment. Mountains, deserts, hot and frigid locales are all home to geodes. All rocks and crystals are minerals, inorganic substances. Mineralogy forms the foundation for geology, which is our investigation of the Earth. To complete our vocabulary lesson, petrology is the study of rocks, and you guessed it, Crystallography is the study of crystals. Geodes form over eons of time in three types of rock. Igneous rock, formed from a volcano's lava that has cooled and hardened. Metamorphic rock develops when extreme heat and pressure cause rocks to melt and flow, changing or morphing as new minerals replace the old ones. Marble is one example. Sedimentary rock is formed when wind, water, and ice break rocks into small pieces called sediment. Large limestone buildings would also be an example. Every crystal has its own chemical formula and geometric order. Crystals are rated by a recognized set of criteria, which you see here. I will discuss a few of these as we view the exhibition, specifically color, luster, and matrix of presentation. Much of this information is recorded in scientific terms. Color will be obvious to your eye, as will qualities from transparency to opacity. But the variety of colors and forms within certain minerals is unexpected. Most importantly for our eye, luster refers to the light reflecting quality of crystals. We will observe luster that is vitreous or glass-like, 
pearly, dull, metallic, or resinous. You may hear me refer to the works on exhibit as geodes, crystals, minerals, specimens, or rocks. I use them interchangeably. This sparkling reddish-brown stone, known as vanadinite, has been mined in Morocco. It appears quite dark until light shines on it, creating a sparkling visual effect. Light reflectivity, or luster, plays an important role in our experience of geos and their crystals. Forms in hexagonal forms, its six-sided reflecting crystals produce high luster. This specimen also shows us the vanadinite matrix, its rock of origin, demonstrating how a rock and crystal together form a geode. Let's observe one of the most abundant and versatile crystals, quartz. Quartz appears vitreous, meaning glass-like, and it can also appear from transparent to opaque. Quartz is made of silicon dioxide. We know silica as glass, which accounts for its frequently transparent appearance. This crystal, like the amethyst, ha also has a hexagonal structure whose many-sided shapes attract the eye, especially by reflecting light. Many geos in this collection are quartz or quartz formed with other minerals. It occurs in many colors and shapes, as we note in this orange quartz from Arkansas, where we again see the many-sided crystals here jutting in different directions, reflecting a great amount of light. We are thrilled to have on exhibit several of the most extraordinary Columbia quartz crystals that you can imagine. These crystals radiate in highly reflective, densely packed needle-like forms in what at first seems to be internal structural chaos, but instead represents the highly prismatic nature of these hexagonal crystals capable of reflecting bright light. Colombian crystals are characterized and valued for their exceptional clarity, which we see here. Amethyst is a type of vitreous quartz, obviously a purple one. Its color is caused by radiation from the environment and from lead and other elements in the soil from which it has been extracted. Amethyst is found in hydrothermal veins and hot springs, as well as in all types of rock. Inside this rough piece of rock from Uruguay are these magnificent hexagonal crystals that reflect light from different angles. Imagine the thrill of extracting from the earth this giant rock filled with sparkling purple crystals. The textural and visual contrast of the rock matrix and the crystalline forms is extraordinary. Nature's art. There are several ways in which an amethyst occurs in nature. It can appear as dark sparkles, as in this one, or the flat translucence of this amethyst from Namibia, and also as the soft lilac of this Mexican amethyst. Amethyst has a long and storied history. For example, the ancient Greeks considered it an antidote to drunkenness, so they carved many wine glasses from it. Other purple crystals mimic amethyst color, but a close inspection of a fluorite reveals differences, notably in the translucent, nearly opaque luster and its cubic form. This affects its appearance and can distinguish it from most amethyst. An interesting thing about this exhibition for me was that I realized that not all geos are sparkling bright reds, greens, blues, purples, oranges, crystals. Many are more neutral in their colors, black, white, gray, brown, and tan, come together in neutral combinations that are no less stunning than the more colorful crystals we look at. We can observe these neutral color combinations in this specimen of quartz and spallurite, which was found in Peru and can be sourced from igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary rock. Spallurite which is paired here with quartz, is the most commonly encountered zinc material and the world's most important ore of zinc. It appears black or gray with a resinous texture. Resinous texture is kind of textural looking. Aside from zinc, it is used for gemstones and in pharmaceuticals and cosmetics. 
Here, Spalierite has formed with quartz to present an interesting shape that is broad and spiky, with the crystals of each mineral protruding upward and outward in such a way that I've nicknamed it porcupine. The four-year-olds in the art center's Half Day for Half Pines program confirmed my anthropomorphic opinion as porcupine. Smoky quartz, seen here as white and black, was sacred to the Druids, for whom it represented the dark power of the Earth's gods and goddesses. It became popular as a mourning stone when Queen Victoria wore it after the death of her husband, Prince Albert, in 1861. Let's turn back to some colorful geodes. We have many examples of azurite and malachite, which often form together, as in this example from Morocco. They indicate the presence of copper ore in the environment. Malachite occurs in every shade of green and is seen in various lusters. Typically, it can be found in deep underground spaces where the water table and hydrothermal fluids provide the means for chemical precipitation. When polished, as it is in this rock from the Congo, malachite appears a brighter green, and some of its features are heightened by the polishing process. Malachite is found in the Ural Mountains in Russia, in Africa from Morocco to the Congo, in Mexico and Arizona. Malachite is one of the most coveted materials in the world. The Hermitage Museum in Russia formerly the Tsar's Winter Palace, contains a malachite room with large wall pilasters and much of the furniture made of solid malachite. It was mined for its copper in Britain for nearly 3,000 years, beginning in 2500 BCE. The ancient Egyptians wore malachite as talismans to ward off evil spirits and natural disasters and to ensure health, success, and especially love. Azurite forms with malachite. It is a prismatic, deep blue mineral produced by weathering of copper ore deposits. Mixed with oil and water, azurite was widely used for blue pigment by painters during the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, and it has often been confused with the more expensive deep blue pigment made from lapis lazuli. I have just learned an art history lie that I picked up in graduate school. Lapis lazuli has typically been identified as the pigment exclusively used for the blue robes of the Virgin Mary. Now, however, I know that lapis lazuli had to be transported expensively and over several months from Afghanistan, whereas azurite was more readily available and less costly. I'd like to introduce you to calcite because it both fascinates and baffles me. More than 800 forms of calcite have been identified, and they can look markedly different from each other. Calcite is vitreous and can appear colorless or white, and just about everywhere on the spectrum, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and brown as well. It may also appear transparent or opaque. This yellow calcite from Uruguay shows how this mineral can sparkle. Like quartz, calcite has a chameleon-like quality appearing in many colors and forms. My first reaction on seeing this rock was to think it was yellow quartz. Though often hard to distinguish some minerals from others, the eye can become trained more or less to identify differentiating characteristics. So, how about this calcite? What I call eagle wings is also calcite, this one with a dull metallic luster. And how about this calcite? It was found at the Palmarejo mine in the Mexican state of Chihuahua. Its texture seemed to vary from bark to swirling crystalline strands to its hard rock matrix. It's hard to believe that each of these I've just shown you is calcite. Different colors, different forms, different lusters, different sources, and yet they are all one mineral. How does this happen? Environmental conditions will affect the formation of calcite or any geode. These include the ore content, temperature, humid or arid conditions, geographical origin, and topographical features. Perhaps we should take a moment here to remind ourselves that these are not abstract sculptures made by human hands, but rather natural formations created by the forces of nature itself. Nature's art, certainly. Some geos in this exhibit defy that explanation 
because they in fact appear more studio art than they do natural formation. Hulandite, stilbite, and quartz form this geode, which seems to be an environment within an open clamshell, an underwater habitat, if you will, where SpongeBob just might enter, formed entirely without human intervention. I didn't believe this, and I went to do some research and found many hundreds of these geodes that look similar to this, so I don't think they are sculpture any longer. Scattered throughout the exhibit are what we have nicknamed Indian rocks. These occur primarily as apophyllite and stilbite, sometimes with other minerals as well. They are found in abundance in the Maharashtra state in India. Apophyllite typically appears as white or colorless, but also as multicolored, light-hued, often green stones that vary from transparent to translucent. Like apophyllite, stilbite also appears in a variety of colors, but is usually white or pink, occurring in rounded shapes or thin tabular projections. It is found throughout chilly North Atlantic coastal areas and also in North Carolina and just across the river near Patterson, New Jersey. Together and in combination here with calcite, these apophyllite and stilbite crystals form powerful light-filled combinations that are more subtle than many other crystals, likely because of their pastel colors and light reflectivity. Pyrite has a fascinating history. Its cubic structure and metallic luster are obvious. Its yellow gold color is both its good and its bad fortune. The most notable historical incidence of mining springs from the mid 19th century gold rush in the Western United States and Canada. Much of the gold that was discovered was in fact not gold, but pyrite, which became known for obvious reasons as fool's gold. 15th century alchemists in Italy revived the ancient pseudoscience of alchemy, which posited that base metals like copper and lead could be transformed into gold, mystically or magically, but always by the alchemist's intervention. In deceitful ways, pyrite was offered as precious gems for its value as currency and adornment. The phrase, buyer beware, comes to mind. For me, one of the most fun geos in this exhibition is scolocyte. It is a colorless pink, salmon, red, or green mineral that occurs as opaque or translucent. Formed under hydrothermal pressure, it appears in sprays of thin prismatic needles and fibrous masses. It is found in many locations from India and Malaysia to Brazil, Mozambique, and California. Contrary to what I consider a delicate, almost fluffy look, scolocyte is brittle and coarse. The word scolocyte comes from the Greek word for a worm. Because of the worm's tendency to crawl into a ball when threatened, it might be considered similar to the balling up of the crystalline forms in this mineral. Some of the rarer or more unusual geos are included in this exhibition. Menangano calcite is a mineral with a pearly luster. It appears in light to dark tones of pink as determined by the amount of manganese present and it contains some inclusions of white calcite. It occurs as both irregular rounded shapes and pointed spiky forms. It is extremely popular with those who believe in the metaphysical healing power of crystals considered to bring peace, compassion, and self-acceptance. Let me interject here that many people have believed in the healing power of crystals from ancient times to the present, attributing selected physical and emotional powers to certain crystals. We have chosen to focus on the scientific and historical aspects instead of on the metaphysical ones. A favorite geode of mine is this celestite from Madagascar. It crystallizes as small prismatic shards that are usually transparent. These shards are very fragile and often break off with very little force from the fingers. To me, its transparency and elusive bluish color are a welcome visual delight. Crystals have many uses beyond their ability to bring joy to the appreciative collector or to enhance a museum or grace a necklace or bracelet. Many have industrial uses. 
We have several examples here in the gallery. Sulfur is used in agriculture as pesticides and fertilizer and in medicine. Iron also has health-related benefits, plus many applications in the construction and transportation trades. It is represented here in the form of hematite, a source of iron, much of which is mined in China. Geos provide alluring visual pleasure, and the many forms and colors we observe in these geos introduce us to a world we could not otherwise know unless we were to see this exhibit or one similar. These are products of the earth. They form naturally inside rocks of all different types. Their colors, their shapes are amazing, and each one is unique. Aside from these incredible visual pleasures, geos allow us a glimpse into the science, history, and folklore that inform these rocks and enhance our appreciation of nature's art. Once again, with many thanks to Bob Wiener. And so ends our virtual tour of the exhibit. But your tour doesn't have to end here. Please visit the gallery and see these splendid rocks for yourself. Bring your friends and family. We offer docented tours limited to 10 people during or after school and on Saturdays with masks and distance protocols in place. We have activities for children of all ages to learn about geos, to view a slideshow of the geos in the exhibit and to sign up online for a tour, go to our website, www.ryeartscenter.org. These geos will be on view through September in the gallery of the Rye Art Center. Thank you for joining me for the Rye Art Center's exhibition of Nature's Art, Geos from the Collection of Robert R. Wiener. And now for a surprise that this exhibition brings you, phosphorescent or glowing rocks. Many rocks can be phosphorescent under certain conditions of the soil, rock, and environment. They glow in the dark when exposed to shortwave ultraviolet light. Also known as black light, it reacts with chemicals in the rock and causes them to glow, often after the light source is turned off. This phenomenon is also seen in glow-in-the-dark paints and toys. a local artist and art instructor, and I'm here to talk about my fluid acrylic paintings inspired by an amazing geode exhibit on view at the Rye Art Center currently. Nature's Art is a geode exhibit curated by Dr. Gail Roman, showcasing geodes from the private collection of Rye Art Center patron, Mr. Robert Wiener. The collection of amazing, bedazzling geodes are from all over the world. I was simply fascinated by the stunning crystals, their shapes, their kaleidoscopic colors, which inspired me to create a whole series of paintings, which are fluid acrylic paintings. Geodes are visually interesting as well as scientifically fascinating. My fluid acrylic paintings showcased at the Riot Center are inspired by some of these blue and yellow crystals, agates, amethysts, peridot, and more. Acrylic pores do take a little bit of experimentation and practice to achieve desired results. To create my fluid acrylic paintings, I've used fluid acrylic paints and pouring mediums. There are many different types of acrylic pouring. Pores take a lot of precision and practice. The ratio of paint to pouring medium, the temperature of the room, humidity levels, all affect the pores differently. For example, one method of acrylic pouring is to take many different colors of acrylic paint, combined with their fluid medium, and pouring directly onto the canvas to get an effect like this. In some of my paintings, I also use rubbing alcohol to get geode-like effects on the actual pour. In another method, you could take fluid acrylic paints, combined with their pouring medium, and pour them one by one onto the canvas to get this type of a result where you can see clean lines of separation between the paint layers. Fluid acrylic paintings can also be manipulated by tilting the canvas, by using a straw to blow so you direct the flow of paint, and so that's one other method of doing it. In some of my paintings, I also use a palette knife to get a swipe-like effect. 
like this one. All fluid acrylic paintings are slow drying. Once they've fully dried and cured, you can seal them using a resin to get a glass-like effect. Or you can use an acrylic varnish. In all of my paintings, I've used a gloss acrylic varnish to get a shimmering effect, much like the geodes themselves. Acrylic pouring is an exercise in letting go. There's only so much you can control in the beginning. And the way the paint flows and sets ultimately is not in your control. So there's always an element of surprise and wonder. If you want to learn more about acrylic pouring, I'm doing a workshop called Crystals on Canvas on June 26th for ages nine and above. Please visit www.ryeartcenter.org to sign up and learn more. Thank you. expression. I've probably tried it. I did like wood carving one time. I'm, I really like ceramics. I like using my hands. So probably like the dirtier and like the harder the art, like that's what I want to do. I won't sit for an hour like drawing, but I'll definitely throw some paint on the canvas. Like I took drawing classes in high school and elementary as well, but I tried ceramics for the first time in high school. It wasn't until college when I wasn't taking any art classes. And I also had like money to just go buy whatever art thing I wanted to. That's when I found lots of joys in painting because I used to be really like, oh, if I'm going to paint something, I should know exactly what I'm painting. This is exactly how much paint I need versus now I'm like, I'll just buy a bunch of paint, <laughs> see what happens. <laughs> I got into the pour paint because I saw it on the internet during quarantine. So I actually didn't do these paints until like a year and a half ago, maybe. And I saw it online and I saw that you could mix your own fluid acrylic paint because pre-bought fluid acrylic is kind of expensive. I mean, to do it a lot. I have like 50 paintings at home, but I found that the Elmer's glue and water and acrylic works perfectly, so it's really cheap and I do it all the time. It's very fun. <laughs> I would say equal parts paint and glue, and then really it's up to you how much water you want to add. Because sometimes if you do a really, really thick pour with a lot less water, you can kind of see through the colors. There's depth, because if you layer like uh, two pieces of color cellophane, they turn into another color. But if it's like you can see orange through a green, and the color isn't mixed, they're just on top of each other. So I think that's really neat. If you add more water, you get more of a mix and like a gradient when you're looking through the colors. So it really depends on what kind of pour you want to do. I like to seal mine in resin and sparkles. Yeah, I just I just like glitter. I think it's very eye catching. But I also think it adds some depth because when you first pour it, it's super thick and liquidy. It looks really cool, and then it dries and it kind of settles into the cracks of the canvas, and it's very textured rather than looking thick and like voluptuous. <laughs> so I add the, the, the resin for the, the like shiny look. I mean part of what this art is, is like letting go of the control you have over the outcome of the art piece. So sometimes it's actually nice after like a long, maybe a not so great day to just come home and pour some paint on a canvas and see what happens. Like just know that it's not going to be what you even predict just is what it is and, and that's like it's kind of nice I mean you know I mean again like my end goal for making artwork is not like will this sell and if, it, if anything it's just soothing to watch the paint swirl around and fall off the edge and what do you get you know and it's pretty much like the geodes too what I really like to do is mix too much paint for a canvas and then continue pouring on lots of little canvases. And then you get, and then you pour in different ways. Sometimes if you scrape it out, that'll make a different pattern than if you let it pour and drip for like an hour. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the paintings change after I pour them because it's really hot outside and they dry really quickly. Sometimes it takes like three days for them to dry and eventually it dries on top and they end up like cracking and ripping away from me, themselves. And I, I don't 
like that, that it turns out like that, but I don't have control over it, and it doesn't ruin the paintings, so, you know. Working here has given me endless amounts of inspiration because I work with people who are doing their own little art projects, you know, all the time. Um, but working on this exhibit was very inspiring because, um, I mean, for example, I kind of shy away from, like, neutral tones, especially with paint. I really like, like, a bright pink and a bright green next to each other. But it's gotten me to do a lot more paintings with, like, neutral tones to get, like, an actual geo look. And so for me, that's enough. Like, this has been a joy to work on. So, And I'm really happy with how it, it came out. Like, it looks gorgeous, so... <laughs> curated uh, this exhibition we're looking at now, Forces of Nature, and it involves two groups of artists from two different groups, the Mamayanek Artist Guild um, and Grand Glass, who are um, a group of fine art photographers. The theme is inspired from the exhibition in the main gallery on geodes, rocks and minerals. And I put this out to artists, asking them uh, to, to submit work that related to the idea and their interpretation of the forces of nature. And I was interested to see what would come in. We have photographers, we have painters, there's works in clay. So in their own medium, they submit work that they've interpreted as being a force of nature, whether it be abstract or representational. We have a small group here. Uh, we can't go through the whole exhibition now because I hope to do that in the walk and talk with the artists. But there's, we have Barbara Kleinman here who has done a collage of watercolor of a volcano, which in, in her own abstracted way is interpreting that. Uh, we have here the Alice Kenny from the Maronek Artist Guild, who has done this beautiful, beautiful, very fine drawing here, just uh, flowers opening out, which is a, a force, force of nature in itself. We have Helen uh, Shrilio, uh, Where the Sky Meets the Sea, which speaks for itself. We've got the edge of the world here and the sky beyond. And we have uh, Alison Nichols here, with uh, e uh, Yellowstone landscapes. There was quite a lot of the na on the national parks, and you know, that's an example um, in a landscape interpretation of the forces, but we also have abstract pieces. As for myself, I'm, a, I'm an artist, I'm a painter and a fiber artist. I do, I have done a lot of artist residencies for Arts Westchester. I have done installations. I'm very interested in community art and also interested in getting artists' work up on walls, particularly in this time. And as an educator, um, I really love to get people to think about the connections. So I think that's it for now. <laughs> and I hope everyone comes to the show. Thank you.